Hey, Bar Convent Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Eric Entrigan. I'm the brand ambassador for Germain Robin, and I'm here with my buddy in uh, all things California brandy. Uh, you want to tell him a little bit about yourself, Scott? Hey, everybody. My name is Scott Richardson, and I am the brand ambassador for a California brandy called Argonaut. Thanks for having me, Eric. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Um, as many of us probably know, the California brandy category is just on the verge of blowing up. And we're here to tell you a little bit more about it and what makes California brandy so absolutely unique in the world of, uh, of distilled spirits, brown spirits particularly. So if you look at um, some of the history of California brandy, uh, you really see um, the fact that uh, there's a huge history in California brandy that a lot of people really don't know much about. There was so many different aspects that I learned about California brandy when I first started researching it that I found uh, that you can really kind of lean on and give you kind of an edge in, in, in talking about California brandy and letting people know how special of a spirit it is. So uh, it all really started with the California missions and California missions are kind of a really fascinating place. Uh, there's 24 of them in California, 21 of them had uh, wine and brandy operations uh, back around the, basically they started building the missions in the late 1600s uh, and they continued all the way through. And they're kind of the major source of a lot of culture in California and a lot of, um, uh, you know, brandy and wine production uh, all the way through the uh, early 1800s. Scott, I think you have something about missions. Yeah, you were, you, it's, you were familiar it's pretty with, right? cool. It's pretty cool to uncover this history of, of the missions in California because I was born and raised in Southern California and long before getting into the world of California brandy, I definitely had a, a different perspective of the missions and it was a little bit more in, you know, in a way of, of typical California tourism. But now I just have such a newfound appreciation for, for how closely tied, you know, not only winemaking, but definitely California brandy making is tied to these missions going up the coast of California, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, they, they brought with them um, the Franciscan monks, brought with them the uh, Liston, uh, Pri, uh, Liston uh, Prieto grape variety, and it uh, was known as the Mission Grape. Still growing down in South America for uh, Pais, you know, brandy, essentially. Um, it's Pais in Chile and, and uh, Criolla over in uh, Argentina. And it's interesting that they brought a grape that basically, even today, is really focused on the production of brandy. So the missions really controlled a lot of this production for a long time, and it wasn't until like the the early 1800s when Mexico gained its independence from Spain, the things started to change. And it wasn't shortly thereafter that you ended up with a, um, you ended up with a, uh, a real dynamic change in the in the demographic of the population of California. So it really starts with the gold rush. And uh, the gold rush had a monumental impact on population growth, but also on the demographic of who was in California. Um, you know, gold rush, most of the people didn't make a lot of money in the gold rush. The people that did make money usually supplied the miners with stuff. But by 1850, the state of California had been created by the United States through Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe. Uh, we ended up with a, a massive land grab, essentially, from, from uh, Mexico at that point in time. And uh, basically, the borders of what you see in the United States now were created at that point in time. But Gold Rush has had a big impact on so many things. It's actually at the, the heart of uh, some of the things uh, that we uh, talk about with Argonaut. Right, Scott? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we dive into a little bit more of kind of the aesthetic of Argonaut, you'll you'll see why this makes a little more sense. But but just even looking back at that at, at during this time of the gold rush, when the miners struck gold, their spirit of choice was more often brandy than anything else, as whiskey was still kind of seen back then as a lower quality spirit, you know, during that time and, and not nearly as approachable of a spirit as brandy was. So uh, you, you start to see the um, the that bias towards a spirit like brandy um, as far back as that and, and even earlier, but this is where the, you know, swelling of the population of California and specifically San Francisco definitely starts to appreciate brandy in these earlier days. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, 20,000 people to 25,000 people after the gold rush in, in San Francisco, just amazing numbers there. Um, so that brandy had to go somewhere, right? And when you think about like what was California look like back then, I mean, if you were to basically, you know, try to make your way to California from New York, uh, it would take you basically three weeks and uh, cost you about a thousand dollars. 
when the transcontinental railroad is put in place, uh, that trip takes you basically three days and costs you about $150. So you can imagine the difference it creates in the ability of a product to travel. And so this is really what happens. So the brandy, I call it the brandy train, just my nickname for it, but actually people have other <laughs> names. Um, but you know, you, you, when you think about Chicago and New York, there were huge markets for, for distilled spirits at this point in time. And it was really something that, uh, you know, we could get the brandy back there. And so it just starts this real amazing growth cycle uh, and plantings in California with grape. And if you see some, there's some amazing photos of what, what Southern California looked like back in, at this point in time. And it was really vineyards for as far as the eye could see. So it's just really a, a thing that is, um, is, is pretty amazing. So one of the things that's really kind of fascinating as well is right about the time the brandy train was created there was a little sneaky bug that we actually have here in america called phylloxera that attacks the roots of vines from a certain species which is the vit vit vitus vinifera vine Vitus vinifera is as many of you probably already know is the vine that's responsible for every quality wine made in the world and so this little insect this little aphid was basically infecting or, or just the beginnings of its infectation in europe and it just ends up destroying huge swaths of vineyard i've heard some places were 80 to 85 percent destroyed some places didn't see quite that level of de destruction but the brandy train allowed brandy to go from california to new york and then to be shipped uh, to Europe. And so it really created this dynamic process where the demand was being driven, not only by domestic market, by, by, by the uh, international market as well. So we'll move on to that. And this kind of creates this golden age of California brandy. And I because the late 1800s to the early 1900s, and I'm speaking specifically of kind of 1919, you really saw this growth kind of go unabated and, and demand was coming from all over. The Germans were buying barrels of brandy for their, their army and navy. The French were buying brandy. Uh, England and, and Ireland became pretty big markets for California brandy. Just pretty amazing that, you know, this product was traveling and it was just achieving a reputation that was much more uh, in the line with the finest quality cognac. And so this really kind of boosted this image of brandy. In one year, in 1891, we made about 600, a little over 600,000 gallons of brandy. The very next year, we distilled 1.8, a little over 1.8 million gallons of brandy. And that's like a, about, you know, 300% increase in production in one year. And it was all being, you know, consumed by domestic and international markets. So, you know, what could go wrong in that situation, right? You know, it's the, everything's going fine. Uh, took a little uh, a movement here called Prohibition, and I think we all know what that did. But it was particularly devastating uh, to brandy production because when you think about how brandy's made, it really requires time in barrel to really develop its flavors. And other types of distilled spirits, even if they go in barrel, sometimes don't require that level of, of, of time and depth for, for the flavor to develop. Add to that the fact that during Prohibition, wine grapes, per se, really aren't used for anything else. They're really used only for, um, you know, wine. And so basically there was nothing else they could use the grapes for. So a lot of the vineyards got ripped out. You know, a lot of places in California kept the vineyards because there was things you could do in Prohibition with like homemade wine or wine for sac sacramental purposes. Um, dist distillate was still being sold through pharmacies for medical purposes and stuff like that. But it wasn't really, you know, this was really a, a, a huge, huge hit to the to the brandy market. So, um, you know, it took basically those 13 years and those 13 years is, is almost a lifetime in brandy production. So all that history, all that kind of reputation we had developed, all that energy we had put into this massive market, particularly from California, because that's where, you know, 90% of the grapes are grown in, in the United States you know, really was a devastating blow uh, to brandy production. And even when you start planting a vineyard again, it really takes about two to three years to get grapes off that, that those vines to be able to produce into wine or brandy. So it, after prohibition, there was this really kind of dramatic, slow process of development over time. And the slow process really kind of creates this, you know, very long drawn out recovery, which really, didn't do a whole lot for brandy 
really up until like the mid 70s. And so it was you had events like the Great Depression, right? Nobody has any money. They've got to go to a product that's probably going to cost them a little bit less. So whiskey gets preferred over brandy because brandy was always a more expensive product, even during the gold rush. That's why the, the miners would would buy that when they um, when they hit their payload. Um, you know, and consumers kind of their, their flavors, their, their taste changed a little bit. And, you know, brandy, uh, if you see it, it's made, you know, mostly in California. Uh, if it's great brandy, if it's apple, you know, there's some apple brandy in the East Coast. And then World War II comes in, obviously a big draw on labor, uh, along with many other things. People are a lot more conservative. So it wasn't until like the 1960s when brandy production or brandy consumption, excuse me, grows by about, you know, four times what it was pre uh, prohibition uh, levels. And with that, you think about you got there's 27 years and you're only growing your market by four times. It's, it's not huge. And it starts from almost a zero market at that point. There was a really interesting uh, law put in place in 1938, and this was something that was pretty, uh, pretty recognizable for California's future. And what it really did is it created this whole identity uh, as California as a brandy producer. So if you were a grape grower in 1938, and there was a lot of vineyards planted right after Prohibition. Uh, you were the state put in uh, a law that was enacted that a grape grower was required to distill 45% of their production into brandy and age it for two years. So this created a big store of brandy that was being uh, produced. But mind you, what's going on in post-prohibition is it's all about getting it done faster, quicker, and more uh, efficient. And so most brandy moves, or almost all brandy, moves to column still distillation, uh, utilized for kind of clear spirits more often and not really the old traditional pot stills that made the great brandy that existed in California prior to Prohibition. And so by 1968, Gallo releases their first brandy, e &J Gallo, but they had been distilling since 1938, so they had a lot of back stock. So I, I'd love to find a bottle of that 1968 release. Yeah. Back, see what that tastes yeah. like. That would be pretty good. Um, Ford producers uh, in 1970 control 90% of the market. So this is, you know, Palmasan, Christian Brothers, Corbell, and and Ian J. Gallo. So it really, you know, they were looking for, you know, a watershed moment that really could kind of create, um, you know, kind of a, a light bulb to go on in people's heads to realize how good California brandy could really be. And it really came kind of simultaneously with wine in the judgment of Paris. And if you're not familiar with what this is, a gentleman named Stephen Spurrier took wines from Napa Valley, Chardonnay and Cabernet, pitted them against uh, Grand Cru um, White Burgundy uh, and uh, first growth and then one second growth uh, Bordeaux from France. And whenever all the ballots were read, they ended up having uh, you know, two California wines on top. It was almost unheard of. Everybody thought California wine was like cheap bulk wine back then. No one believed it was the quality that you saw here. So it's pretty fascinating in the sense that, you know, this kind of really changed the dynamic of the world's viewpoint on California wine. So it wasn't too long after that, that you really started seeing uh, the birth of this new golden age. And I mentioned this because we're really looking at, you know, pot stills returning, most notably was Germain Robin, St. George, and... Um, and Charbet, but there's renewed interest in quality brandy as we start producing more, putting more stuff in barrel, getting those flavor profiles to come back to what it was. Uh, events like, you know, Busta Rhymes passed the Cavassier song. Uh, funny story, he loves Hennessy better than Cavassier, but it worked better than the song. <laughs> you know, by 2011, there's over 30 breweries utilizing pot stills and making really high quality brandy uh, in the U.S. And, uh, you know, just to show you that it's not just us where the market continues to grow. In 2012, China surpasses uh, the USA in demand for brandy. So the future is really bright and there's really unlimited possibilities for California brandy. I think um, Scott wants to take us through a little bit about uh, the grape varieties that make this uh, brandy so unique. Yeah, thanks, Eric. You know, one of the most reoccurring themes today will be about the grapes and rightfully so. Just as you would imagine a whiskey producer speaking about the whiskey's grains used in a mash bill, it's even more important and, and even more interesting in, in my mind to speak specifically about the grapes used in Californians, California's wines that are destined to ultimately become brandy. The number one thing that makes California's brandy, uh, California brandy's base material so different from other brandies around the U.S. and around the world is quite simply those fruit forward new world style of flavorful grapes. And in California, we're fortunate to have almost every type of wine grape known to the industry uh, to be able to experiment with here. 
So, you know, without California's incredible climate, it wouldn't be possible for a wide variety of these grapes to be cultivated. And this is due to so many microclimates throughout the, st the state. And climate and harvest are both so important to this idea of provenance for a craft spirit. Uh, and this is really one of my favorite aspects of California brandy because it's what contributes to those uniquely Californian flavors and aromatics that cannot be replicated anywhere else in the world. You know, and to make the best California brandies, you have to farm the grapes for very low harvest sugars for, for some reasons that we might be able to talk a little bit more about later. Um, but really just realizing that a, a gentle approach to harvesting will ensure that we have the most pristine grapes for brandy production. All of this basically means that that we have endless, endless opportunities for flavor exploration in making all sorts of California brandy. You know, in this next slide, we'll we'll take a look at this wide palette of all these flavors and um, and how that kind of can relate to innovation within this category. You know, more than any other category of spirits, I would argue um, it's it's a more significant discussion to highlight the raw materials of California brandy due to these endless flavor profiles that you can enjoy even before the oak and the maturation has anything to do with that final spirit. So when you really just think about that that spirit coming straight off the still, we, we have this wide palette of colors to play with here. So let me just give you a, a few examples of, of how different grape varieties influence the final brandy blends here. You know, we could talk about whites and red grapes too, but even just hey, within Scott? white, Oh yeah, go ahead. What about, I mean, like when you think, like when somebody walks in a, in a market, when you think about, you know, what you're looking at, how many, you know, varieties of corn beer do you see on a shelf versus how many, you know, varieties of wine? I mean, that's that, that's the thing that sticks in my head. Like, you know, wow, there's this massive palette that you get to work with in California brandy. Exactly. That's a great point is when, when you can really think about the the such wide variety of different types of grapes and all these microclimates like I mentioned before and, and you really have that that winemaking mentality to this right as opposed to thinking of 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 the basic nature of a lot of these different types of grains and in very familiar spirits to all of us like like whiskey right so you know some of the some of the white grapes we use um, pretty frequently columbard and chardonnay are a couple of them um, Columbard will give the distiller really nice notes of apple, pear, even some some floral aromatics um, with a really balanced mouthfeel. It's no surprise that Columbard is such a great base to build a, a complex blend from. And so you'll see that come through when we start to look through some specific types of California brandy blends. And Chardonnay can add different types of apple notes um, as, as well as pear, but can start to introduce some really interesting things like pineapple with a heavier oak character to it as well. And so you can just go down the list of all different types of white grape varietals um, and some of these different notes and characteristics that end up in the final brandy are, are some of the similar characteristics you'd imagine from actually consuming that type of grape, especially if it's something like Chardonnay, when you're talking about consuming it as a still wine, which is really interesting. And um, I can even speak just a little bit about a couple of the red grapes um, that, that you can find some, some fantastic California brandies from uh, Pinot Noir. I know Eric will talk a little bit more about that grape. It can add so much complexity, lots of different types of notes of cherry and a really nice texture to the final brandy um, with that grape. Grenache can add some really nice fresh red raspberry notes and almost a slightly more oily texture. So you might not want to use too much of a grape like Grenache in a blend of brandy that's utilizing multiple grapes because you want to um, be sensitive to the type of texture that you're creating in that final liquid profile. So there's just all sorts of things that can come from from different types of grapes, both red and white, um, and and that's that's really what what lends itself to to having a greater discussion about the raw materials in California brandy. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of the importance that California wine grapes will have on the brandies that that really seek to experiment with them. You know, and California is no stranger to innovation in many ways, uh, and it, the same is true for for its brandy production. The loose guidelines around American brandy production allow for producers to optimize the processes to make the best brandies possible. And this reality spans across the major steps of production. Uh, and so, just like I mentioned about the wide ranging flavors of the California wine grapes, you can really visualize the palette of colors we can use to prepare for distillation. And so speaking of distillation, um, 
overall there's there's a, a, a lack of certain amount of rules regarding distillation and oak aging methods of, of not only California brandy, but also American brandy altogether. Um, so I'll speak to the distillation side of innovation. Um, and I know Eric might be able to, to speak about some of the blending practices too. Um, but this is a glimpse of the McCall Distillery in Sanger, California. This is really one of the oldest distilleries in the state and it actually houses 20 660 gallon Alembic copper pot stills built by Robert Prulo of Cognac, France. And that name is the most renowned um, craftsman name of building those traditional Cognac style pot stills. Uh, this type of still has been used for literally hundreds of years in making some of the best brandies around the world. And when we yeah, use definitely these- Definitely the gold standard right there, Scott, for, for, for Cognac pot stills. Yeah, absolutely. You can kind of see a, a, a slightly closer image um, if, if you can uh, see the picture behind me um, on this video, actually, of, of, of what some of those some of those traditional stills look like. Scott um, and I are actually at the McCall Distillery, but we're in two different places to practice social distancing just to make sure we're safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when we use these stills, we, we put the freshly fermented wines through two stages of, of distillation. So we are following that, that traditional double distillation method um, that a, a very well-known brandy around the world like Cognac has followed for many years. Um, but let me tell you a little bit why the producer might want to use a traditional Cognac style still um, versus the, the column still. Uh, if you could just go back one slide real quick, um, I'll just mention that and then we can kind of compare um, to the column stills. You know, with this pot still, the distillates that come off of these can, can really lend to a more complex spirit giving a richness and elegance rather than highlighting very specific characteristics of that one grape that the distiller might be using. Um, and also these stills are ideal for aging um, or for spirits that are destined to age for longer periods of time in oak. Um, but we'll be able to understand this better uh, with the next slide about column stills, just to give you a frame of reference. Since we are able to use multiple distillation types in making California brandy, um, so we do use column stills in California as well. And with this still type, we're able to separate the elements of the spirit much more cleanly than you would be able to in a pot still. And that allows us to target specific characteristics, like for example, a specific type of fruit or floral note off of that grape, whether it's a red or white grape in the new distillate. Um, and these, these stills can really be engineered specifically um, to allow the distiller to move certain types with a really high degree of precision, 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 sorry. Um, so anyone that's listening right now that that kind of understands some of the basics of distillation, you can imagine um, just how how um, how much art there is that you can bring to this process of switching between two different types of stills. But my favorite way to understand the use of different stills uh, is through this analogy that I like to speak about. Um, so You've got stage lights and spotlights on, on a certain type of play. Uh, if you're looking at, at an act happening in front of you, right? Um, stage lights are like the traditional pot stills. Sometimes there's so much happening on stage that the ambiance of stage lighting lets your eyes wander across all of the individual characters without any single one of them stealing the show. Um, in other words, it allows the distiller to bring a well-rounded experience to life, showcasing the depth and complexity rather than the indiv individual aspects of a single type of grape. Um, in contrast, you've got spotlights. Uh, those are kind of like the column stills, and, and those highlight a very particular actor on stage, if you will, uh, just like a distiller would highlight particular flavors from that actual grape. I know we're having a couple technical difficulties here, more than a um, more than a couple. My apologies. <laughs> it's okay. We're good. There you go. We're rolling through with it. Yeah, th this visual will kind of help um, uh, further, uh, I guess, uh, accentuate that analogy with the stage lights and spotlights. But it really just helps you. Um, really just helps you visualize how there are different qualities um, of the distillate from utilizing these methods. And you really can't say that one is necessarily any better than the other. I mean, it's really. Um, comes down to the art of the blend um, before it goes into the final bottle, right? And it really comes down to what that distiller and blender, um, what he or she is, is really specifically envisioning that one brandy to be at the end of the day. Um, so just wanted to to hone in on on that 
um, fact of that, that we can really leverage these different types of fantastic stills in California to make the best brandy. Yeah, those column stills, I mean, if you're using a variety like Viognier or something like that, that's super floral, I mean, the column still seems like that would make a lot of sense to me to be able to highlight that characteristic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's there's a wide range of aging options for California brandy as well. Um, you know, before we even start to talk about the the art of blending, um, and at Argonaut specifically, um, we age our brandies in ex bourbon barrels, um, which is a little different from the barrels used by Germain Robin uh, that I know Eric will be able to speak a little more to. But one quick note about these ex bourbon barrels for Argonaut, um, they we see it as that they really let the fruit characteristics and the floral characteristics of that new distillate in that brandy um, shine first and foremost because we don't want to risk over oaking um, th those uh, those nuanced and complex characteristics with too much fresh new oak so we really like um, the the, the neut neutrality that you get from uh, a, a barrel that has already properly aged a bourbon in its past yeah, that's great. I mean, we use uh, we use classic cognac barrels, uh, limousin, Vicard, air dried barrels that are three hundred to three hundred fifty liters. So completely different than what we use for uh, for Argonaut. So really a different animal altogether. I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about the art of the blender. And uh, this is David Wartner, our head of distilling, and uh, pretty amazing guy. This photographic memory just blows me away sometimes. How <laughs> stuff he can remember in his head. Um, but you know. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, once a blend is decided, and David is always very fond of saying, like, it, it's never like a clear arc in, in what the, the brandy is doing in barrel. It's always an up and down kind of process, and you never really see brandy kind of being, uh, you know, being produced in a fashion that is – uh, you know, is really consistent to them uh, once they're seeing it in barrel. They have to wait till it gets to that sweet spot. And you saw that on the barrel a little while ago, that that's really where they like it. And then sometimes they might put it in like a glass lined uh, tank or, or something of like that just to keep it in stasis. But this blending process, the trials really takes about, you know, nine months for them to come up with a blend for each uh, release of uh, Germain Robin or Argonaut. And in doing that, what they're really trying to accomplish is, you know, a consistency between, you know, they, they don't mind a little bit of difference, but a consistency between just so the brand is really seen as, as being similar uh, in each of its releases. Once the, the brandy kind of comes together in that blending trial, it has to go back into barrel for uh, three to um, six months to blend, uh, to kind of marry together uh, before it can go into bottle. And uh, I think this is like, you know, Scott and I both talk about this, but I think this is kind of why, how I see California brandy. If you have that palette to paint this picture with, with all these colors, I mean, what happens if they painted that Starry Night picture with just one color, which is beige? And that's kind of what they do in cognac. They got one great variety to work with. And although they produce great brandy uh it does limit them a little bit i don't know how you feel about it, scott but. yeah no i mean i think it's a great way to put it it's, it's kind of like talking about the two different types of stills in the sense of of you you know you can't just you can't just say oh one is is any better than the other for a specific reason i mean it, it's it's all it's all just different types of ways of innovating a certain spirit and different profiles you're going for that you can appreciate and everyone appreciates those differently right so i think it it really helps to understand both of these um, types of spirits to just elevate the overall category of brandy as a whole around the world yeah yeah so i mean for me i just think it's you know the, the potential for california brandy is really limitless we're just starting i mean you know we have product uh as your man Robin, that was distilled in 1983 and you know to have that backlog of, of all these these great brandies that have been distilled over time it really gives you an idea of you know the time required to produce great brandy i mean hubert is mentioned to me you know you know a lot of times brandy doesn't taste that good until it's been in barrel for six to seven years and that's when it starts hitting its sweet spot when you talk to people in cognac they might actually say you know for grand champagne cognac they're really looking at 25 to 35 years where that stuff tastes any good so it really requires time uh, and uh, you know but this limitless ability in creating different forms of brandy really kind of plays out uh, with uh, the introduction of, of Argonaut. You know we like to say that Californians were destined to make brandy for many reasons and in the spirit of American ingenuity and the deeply rooted California heritage within the Gallo family, Argonaut brandy was created. Uh, but first, before we move on, let's just ask the question, what is an Argonaut? Well, the Argonauts were the original fortune seekers during the gold rush. 
uh, you know, in this next slide, you'll kind of see a little bit about that. They they really left everything behind to settle westward in search of adventure and opportunity. Over time, it was that energy and that conviction of these Argonauts that laid the foundation for the state of California, which we've all kind of seen has, has become an incubator for the ambitious in, in so many different industries in so many ways. Uh, so we we ultimately tapped into that spirit to create a uniquely Californian brandy that's uninhibited by some of Europe's rigid restrictions of old world brandy making. This is an image of our head distiller and, and blender, Rita Hansen, also known as the brandy queen in our world. Her experience of over 20 years across winemaking and spirits making is illustrated through the innovative blends of Argonaut that she has um, that she has the luxury to make. And it, it, she's able to be more transparent about our blends um, than just about any other liquid out there. Um, and it's in my, my opinion that in the world of craft, craft spirits nowadays, trust is the new currency. So this mentality is really evident on the back of every bottle of Argonaut. So let's take a look at some of our expressions. First, what you have here um, is Argonaut Saloon Strength. Um, this is a higher proof brandy in our portfolio. It's built to really be a bartender's cocktail brandy. And I literally mean that because it's actually only available to bars and restaurants and in the on-premise channel. So bartenders absolutely love this one. Um, but let me go back to that blending grids, you know, printing, printing those grids on the back of every bottle. And that's kind of what we've blown up here for you to see. It's really unparalleled in the industry. Uh, and these grids highlight the grape varietals, the still types, and the exact age statements of each leg of brandy that contributes to the final blend. So there's so many rabbit holes you could probably go down by looking through each, each of our bottles within these grids, right? But I do wanna keep it short and concise for you. And so I like kind of mentioning one special thing for each of our expressions here, you know? And the, the first thing that ca captures my eye here is you really look at those top two lines of those different legs of brandies, right? You got two years and then the next one in there you've got 19 years some people might think that someone like rita hansen would have been just just crazy for blending some of our oldest distillates that we have um uh, been sitting in barrel with some of our youngest most vibrant brandies but really she she cares that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and that's the mentality she takes across all of argonauts blends so if the quality of the final blend is better when combining some of our oldest and youngest barrels then that's what matters most um, and so this is a great representation of that um, but you really get some nice red fresh cut red apples dipped in caramel right off the nose on this brandy and then you just get some 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 nice dark um, red fruits some cherry um, some candied citrus um, and then some of those oak influenced spices um, from some of those older legs i mean this is just such a well balanced brandy that's really meant to act like just a cocktail workhorse in, in so many ways and, and, and a great introduction into into craft california brandy um, but let's compare that with um, some of our other expressions as well. So this next one's Argonaut Speculator. This is a bit lighter, um, more a little bit more on the floral side of our California brandies um, and a little bit more citrus forward as well and a slightly drier finish. Um, if you remember earlier, I mentioned a little bit about uh, pineapple being a specific characteristics from one of the, the grapes that we use in California brandy, and that was from the Chardonnay grape. Uh, well, you can actually pick up on some of that in this blend and due to the transparency, you can see some of the legs in here are some well aged Chardonnay brandies. And so some of those some of those flavor profiles will influence this. And it's no surprise that sometimes I see more craft rum drinkers appreciate this expression more than than others. And there's a really nice stone fruit and tropical fruit notes that end up in this profile so it can really show the the versatility of California brandy and speculator is definitely a great one um, and particularly playing well in warmer months too, despite what some people might think of um, stereotypically as the world in the world of brandy. Um, you can think about French 75s, mint juleps, sidecars, some of my favorite modern classics like the Gold Rush or Paper Planes. Um, I mean, this this one can knock those all out extremely well um, and, and, and very versatile um, and similar in fashion to what we just covered with the saloon strength before it. Well, let's move on to the fat thumb. Um, this is particularly one of my favorites. Um, this is the richest style that Scott, we have. Scott, this was this just letting everybody know. This was the brandy that won the cocktail shakers competition 
or the BU Shakers comp Spirit Shakers competition uh, for our, our business unit. So yeah, just, I got the belt <laughs> to prove it because I was yep. the one that created that cocktail, which is a, which is a little embarrassing just because there's a lot of bartenders in there and I'm a sommelier. But hey, yeah, I'm not yeah. I'm not saying anything. Thanks so. thanks for rubbing that in there because I because I, <laughs> I, 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 I also used Fat Thumb and and and, and you still beat me out on that. Um, hey, this, this is but, up for grabs, Scott. Next time. Oh yeah, no, I'm <laughs> definitely going to take it next year. Um, <laughs> But this this is really perhaps the the best in our lineup for your real spirit forward cocktails. Fewer ingredients. I mean, you're talking about your three ingredient classics. Um, but but honestly, incredible to sip neat or just over a block of ice if you really want to get the the full depth that California brandies can offer. Um, so you can really have confidence uh, in using this one um, with your classics like your old fashions and Manhattans and all sorts of riffs like that, which 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 really kind of round out the versatility of our lineup of California brandies. Um, but you know some of the accolades with Fat Thumb really really kind of speak for itself. Um, but I do like to say that you know Fat Thumb is it's more elegant in a sense like a cognac because um, you can see a heavier degree of these those traditional alembic pot still distillates used in this blend. But unlike a cognac, it's use of both types of stills like those stage lights and spotlights I mentioned earlier really uniquely highlight those red and white grape varietals as well um, and some of those other characteristics from those stills to bring more fruit to the palate first and foremost even though there still is plenty of aging and mellowing happening on this brandy as well baked apple cobbler is one of the things that sticks out with me when, when you're sipping this one um, different types of jam uh, nutmeg and clove too. I mean, th th this is really uh, the pinnacle for me um, of, of what California brandy can do um, since you, you can really sip every last drop of this and appreciate all those nuanced flavors, but still feel um, free to, to mess around with it in cocktails as well. So, you know, that really concludes my portion about Argonaut specifically. And I just want to say that I'm so honored to be on the forefront of Argonaut Brandy and to work with you, Eric, on our ultimate goal of showing uh, the greater country why California Brandy should really take its place in the pantheon of quality brown spirits. So thank you for having me on this. My pleasure. Thanks for being on it. I mean, I, I, you know, my brand here is Jermaine Robin, and I just, you know, I, you know, when they called me to ask me if I was interested and I said, what's the brand? They said, Jermaine Robin. I said, I'm in, you know. They said, don't you want to know what the job is? I go, no, not really. I mean, I, you know, my point is that, you know, when you're you're dealing with something, you really got to believe. In. And um, Jermaine Rubin is something that I've believed in from the very first time I tasted it back in the uh, early 90s. And it's uh, just a phenomenal product. And and it has a lot to do with the story behind the two gentlemen that founded it. Hubert Jermaine Robin is a uh, seventh generation cognac distiller who basically his family sold their their cognac house, um, Jules Robin, to a major cognac house. Uh, and he was basically either going to go to work for cognac distilling producers because he had just this vast level of knowledge and dis distillation, uh, or he was going to go do something different. And he came to California looking for uh, something to do, and he runs into this guy, Ansley Cole, while he's hitchhiking across Sonoma wine country or Mendocino wine country. They, you know, Ansley picks him up and they start talking about what Hubert wants to do and create like a great brandy, but, you know, not in cognac, but in California. And so that's what they start doing. They were really visionary in the sense, first off, they were one of the few people to bring back, or they were really the only distiller to bring back pot stills that focused exclusively on uh, wood aged grape brandy. A lot of the other distillers that, that started at the same time were more focused on clear brandies and a wider mix of, of spirit, but Germain Robin was really focused on, on creating the best grape brandy they could. One of the other things that was really fascinating that they did was they basically started off because of he bears, you know, knowledge base and what he was thinking about in trying to produce those brandy he those brandies he was really trying to figure out a way uh, to utilize grapes he knew from cognac so the, the comparison would be close and so he started looking for uni blanc or, or uh, trebbiano in california which there's a lot of it grown but it all tends to be in the central valley and the quality of it there just isn't really the same you see uh, as in in france and so they quickly realized that it was a lot easier for them to distill local Mendocino grapes uh, that were destined for wine production into um, 
into brandy. They, they had to move it a little bit. The, the harvest numbers you heard Scott talk about, you know, really we're looking for an eight to nine percent alcohol, uh, potential alcohol level in the grapes, uh, whereas in like table wine, we're looking for 12 to 13 percent typically. So they had to move that number a little bit. So it took a little bit of a learning curve for them. But the first distillate they did with wine grapes was this 70 year old Simeon. If you're familiar with what's going on in California nowadays, well, not this year because of all the fires, but you know, we'll see how that works out. But uh, really, you know, seven, old Simeon, that was something that, you know, you couldn't give away in the, in the 90s or eight late, you know, early 80s. Uh, now there's like, you know, you got to line up and, you know, beg for it. But um, they started with Simeon, created a great, great uh, experience for uh, expression for brandy. Uh, but it wasn't until Hubert the following year distilled Pinot Noir that he said this was, uh, and this is his quote exactly, it was the best I'd ever seen. Uh, and it wasn't until about six years later than that, that he really felt he had perfected the distillation of Pinot Noir. So this whole idea behind you know, the different grape varieties we talk about is one of the things is really the main factor that makes California so unique in brandy production. And I like to talk about the fact that you know, many of the other great brandy producing regions around the world utilize a, a, a very narrow band of grapes. And most of them almost exclusively are white. Very few brandy uh, producers use red grapes. It's just a more difficult grape to work with. And so it really requires kind of a hands-on method of working through that. Our process, like I mentioned, the grapes come in, they have to be between eight, nine and 10% um, alcohol. They get distilled very quickly. And the other thing that's very interesting is you cannot use sulfur uh, dioxide in fermentation for uh, for grapes that are destined for brandy because that, that aroma will end up in the distilled spirit. So fermentation occurs fairly quickly at a fairly low temperature with a specific yeast that will operate at that temperature. Um, once the fermentation is done in cognac, you have about up till April 1st of the following year from the date of harvest to actually distill your grapes into brandy. But I've talked to David a couple of times and he's just like, Dude, if you if you do that, you know, that's his exact words. Dude, if you if you do that, you know, you're going to lose all that freshness that's coming out of the, the fermented grapes. And so he wants it in the still within 15 to 30 days. And that, that really creates a much better aromatic distillate than you see uh, anywhere else. Once the distillation is done, the product is produced. And the distillation is interesting. If you're familiar with, you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with, you know, uh, double pot still distillation. But there's this 12-hour process in the secondary uh, distillation, right? Uh, the Bonshoff distillation. And in that period of time, there's a 90 second window of time where you have the ability to get like these great vibrant flavors or the, or the distillate goes bitter. And you can see it. I mean, you can just sit there in front of the stone, you just taste and you run your finger through it and taste and taste and taste. And you just see that bitterness coming in. And once it hits, it's like immediate. It starts and they have to cut that distillation right there in the middle of the body to maintain that kind of luscious, viscous, uh, type of uh, alcohol that goes into the barrel. So once it goes into the barrel, um, it really, you know, it, it needs to age for a minimum period of time. We use, like I mentioned, air dried barrels from the Limousin Forest in France, exactly the same barrels you see in cognac production. Uh, Resting in barrel, you know, it goes into a new barrel. The brand, new brandy goes into a new barrel for about nine months, comes out, goes into a, a second use barrel, anywhere from one to five years. And then after that, it spends the, the majority of, it, of its lifetime aging in barrel in much, much older barrels, some over 100 years old. And these old barrels really don't add a lot of wood flavor, but what they do add is they add kind of this molding or this kind of like shaping of the brandy because so many other brandies have been in those barrels. It really creates a really dynamic um, uh, situation there and in, in, in what you can get out of that barrel. Hand bottling, necessary. I mean, just like hand cutting for the distillation, you have to do that. When you're working with, you know, 30 to 40 grape varieties, you can't depend on a number that's going to give you that alcohol content or that avoid that bitterness that you see in the distillation. So everything gets hand bottled. Um, after the, the blend is made, I mentioned it has to rest in barrel for three to six months, uh, and then it goes into bottle and everything is hand bottled. Um, where we are today with Germain Robin, you know, this is a pretty special thing. Actually, Hubert Germain Robin left Germain Robin Distillery in Mendocino in 2008. Uh, when we uh, purchased the distillery, or all the old stocks um, of brandy and the name for Germain Robin, we uh, asked Hubert if he would come back to consult with us. And he had one comment for us, and that was, what's your end goal uh, for um, 
what's your end goal for the brandy? And David Wartner says, I always thought uh, Jermaine Rubin was about making the best brandy in the world. So uh, that was his goal. And um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we create two right now. Uh, Jermaine Rubin produced a lot of brandy in the past, and we felt like these two expressions represent the best of Jermaine Rubin. Uh, the Alembic brandy is based around Columbard. Uh, it's a minimum of seven years of age. And I always find this delicious sort of orange marmalade. David finds a lot of uh, green apple in it, but I think the fruit in Germain Robin really comes through. The other is the XO, and this is the one that Hubert felt was, could stand up to any uh, great brandy in the world, and this is based around Pinot Noir. And when I say based, I mean the base typically makes up about 70% of the blend. But when uh, with uh, XO, you really see this, this, this really absolutely delicious uh, characteristic coming through that is uh, that is you know really tied to the age for one thing, which is a minimum of 12 years old. But you get all these rancio characteristics. You get these cherry fruit that comes back in the back, and there's this black walnut com component that comes through, and it's just a really beautiful expression of brandy from anywhere in the world. Um, when you think about what we've got going on with our packaging, we've uh, got these new boxes, which everybody's excited about. They represent that that print on the on the lighter box, which you, you see a little bit cl more clearly, is a uh, a crosscut of a sinker redwood log tree uh, that was uh, unearthed uh, or basically pulled up from the big river in Oregon. And it really represents kind of the iconic image of Germain Robin and uh, ties it all to the two places it's been produced, once in Mendocino in, in the middle of the redwoods and now in Sanger, which is right at the base of the Sequoia National Forest. So not my quote, but I do use it quite often. Uh, this is a fantastic great brandy. Uh, I encourage you to try it if you get a chance and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from anybody who wants to contact me. Uh, and I'm at Jermaine Robin, uh, Eric at Jermaine Robin. And uh, thank you very much for uh, sitting through our seminar today. Scott, thank you for being with me and telling us all about the great product in uh, Argonaut. And I will continue to use Fat Thumb and win more of the competition. And I'm going to keep this belt. Good luck. You're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you. Okay, so I can...